thank you to Western ACDA and Dr. Saplan for inviting me on for this webinar. The things I'll discuss with you today are the Cuban choral system, starting with music education through professional and community music, Digna Guerra, one of the most well-known and influential choral conductors in Cuba, director of the Coro Nacional de Cuba, the National Choir of Cuba, the top professional choir in the country, with a legacy that includes the creation of a national choral curriculum and the influence of a generation of conductors, and the sense of purpose that drives Cuban choral musicians. Why this topic? I like to say, why should I care? Pay attention to questions like that because the answers are very valuable. For me, it's my personal connection as the child of two Cuban immigrants. This research trip allowed me to travel to my parents' homeland, which my dad left as a baby and my mom left as a five-year-old child, and they never returned. And I got to meet family I had never met before and put my feet on the land that I had heard about my whole life. So it was very significant for me personally. There's also geographical and political interest. At the time of my interviews, there had been recent hopeful change in the political relations between the U.S. and Cuba with then-President Obama. Shortly after, in a familiar political cycle, things became uncertain under a new U.S. presidential administration potentially affecting future travel and therefore cultural exchange between choirs and choral connectors in Cuba and in the United States with then-President Trump. Things are unknown once again. Digna Guerra visited with me at the University of Miami for the first time on her way back home from a United Nations Women's Summit. Miami is a city with strong but often contentious ties between Cubans on the island and Cuban-American exiles. On the same day, then U.S. President Barack Obama communicated the following on his first full day in Cuba. It's humbling to be the first U.S. president in nearly 90 years to visit a country and a people just 90 miles from our shores. In my research, a strong sense of purpose came across from Cuban choral musicians. There was cultural pride and duty, love and respect for country and for one another. In this pandemic, our priorities and our sense of purpose have in some cases become clarified. What's important, what's not important. If what we love, choral music, becomes risky, what remains of our field at the moment? What do we miss the most? What do we keep or discard long-term? What does all of this tell us? Spoiler alert, I won't be answering this for you, but I ask you to consider these questions for yourself and your own career. Cuba has a long and rich history of choral music spanning more than four centuries. After the Cuban Revolution, the island underwent many related changes, including a nationalistic cultural movement resulting in a restructured music education system. The inception of the Cuban professional choral system coincided with the triumph of the Cuban Revolution, as the Cuban people say, in 1959. The island was swept with patriotic fervor, resulting in the formation of multiple amateur choirs to celebrate the victory of the newly formed government. This was followed by the establishment of multiple national and international choral festivals held in Cuba, and the eventual conversion of an accomplished amateur choir into a professional choir to be followed by the formation of many others at the suggestion of a new government organization, the National Council of Culture. While professional choirs in the U.S. make up just 12% of overall choral participation, Cuba has a more robust system of professional choirs, with one to two residing in each of its 14 provinces. The city of Havana alone houses eight professional choirs. The post-revolution expansion of the education system and national cultural activity included widespread access to music education. Cuba's secondary music education system is outlined in the ethnographic research of Lisa Lorenzino. There are two separate streams of music education within the state-sponsored schools. The first stream is the general stream from preschool through seventh grade, which provides a general music education. The second stream is the specialized stream and is divided into three levels. Nivel básico, basic level, beginning in third or fifth grade. Nivel medio, middle level, beginning in the 10th grade. And nivel superior, which is their university level. Digna Guerra is a founder and retired professor of the university level Instituto Superior de Arte, Superior Institute of Art, known as the ISA, in Havana. Students being educated within the specialized stream are prepared to perform and teach music professionally. All music education and any necessary class materials are provided by the government. Leonor Suarez is the conductor of Camerata Vocales Cine Nomine, a professional male chamber choir specializing in early music. 
She commented that when in the U.S., she is asked frequently about professional choirs in Cuba. She says, the organizations are state institutions. The singers receive salaries. Every day we come to work, which is like our office. Every month we meet programming goals that are planned one year in advance, and then we add everything that gets thrown in along the way. While this position is the singer's main job, some have additional side jobs. The salary for conductors is quite modest, and the singer's salaries are a little less, but there's not a huge difference. There are also monetary bonuses for additional important events. The Coro Nacional has approximately 50 singers at any given time. The singers also sing in two chamber choirs. Entre Voces, the 20 voice international touring choir conducted by Guerra, and De Profundis, conducted by Ladi Sotomayor. The National Children's Choir, the Coro Nacional Infantil, was also under Guerra's direction until recently. It has ranged from 30 to 80 singers from 8 to 14 years of age. In addition to the main children's choir, there is a choir of itty bitty children that Guerra affectionately refers to as piojitos, a Cuban term of endearment for small children. This age ranges from one and a half to three years, and there are about 40 in that ensemble. There are currently singers in the Coro Nacional who were founding members of the children's choir. Another choir named La Preparatoria, the preparatory choir, is made up of older girls training for the Coro Nacional. The Cantorías are Digna Guerra's brainchild, an initiative to bring community children's choirs to hundreds of children in underserved areas with the assistance of her former student and Coro Nacional singer Delfina Acai. This project arose from a deep love of country, love of fellow Cubans, and a desire to be of service. Acai shared, Maestra Digna does not only dedicate herself to music, her love to the land where, where she was born makes her want to help. The government, the state, our children, whatever it is. The maestra calls me to say, Fifi, please help. We're going to do something in the municipality of Centro Havana, Central Havana, a neighborhood with many social issues where kids need artistic projects to get them out of their house so they can be in a cleaner environment, mentally healthy, to take away the hours when they would be on the streets. A guy was no longer able to sing with the Coro Nacional due to health issues and raising her daughter. However, when Guerra called upon her to co-lead the Cantorías, a guy felt it was her duty. When she told me, Fifi, help me, what was I supposed to do? Maestra Digna Guerra is one of the most influential living figures in Cuban choral music. As the conductor of the country's flagship choral ensemble, the Coro Nacional de Cuba, since 1975, and one of the founders of the Instituto Superior de Arte, Guerra has the unique perspective of a public figure whose work began in the early years of the Cuban Revolution, was shaped by its influence, and in turn shaped the emerging and now flourishing music education and performance establishments of modern-day Cuba. Notable performances involving the Coro Nacional and the U.S. in recent years include a performance of the Cuban and U.S. national anthems at a baseball game attended by then U.S. President Barack Obama and then Cuban President Raul Castro, as well as a performance with the Rolling Stones later that week. Guerra has also served as choral director of the Opera Nacional de Cuba, the National Opera of Cuba, and was previously director of the Coro de la Radio y la Televisión, Radio and Television Choir and assistant director of the Symphonic Orchestra of Cuba. She has organized multiple national and international choral festivals, notably Coravana, America Cantat, and the newest Viva la Amistad Choral Festival, Long Live Friendship Choral Festival in Havana with ACDA in 2018. There have been many collaborations with the United States, often bittersweet due to long established political tensions. The first Coravana Festival in 1999 garnered 13 choirs from the United States and numerous Cuban choirs as well. This initial festival was named Encuentro Coral Cuba, Estados Unidos, Cuba United States Choral Encounter. The following year, there was an unfortunate reduction in attendance. We did it in 2002, but then Bush became president and started kicking things around and forbidding travels. So this decreased choir circulation. We got fewer and fewer choirs until they stopped coming all together because they would get penalized. So things were over. It was a shame too, because it was so wonderful. We would have a final party where everyone would come together and mingle. It was precious, but it's a shame that this cultural exchange initiative was lost because our people have always loved each other. The rest of the battles are a different story. Guerra was selected to participate in the ACDA International Conductors Exchange Program in 2012, 
but had her visa unfortunately denied, leaving her unable to travel and fully participate along with the six other Cuban choral conductors. Guerra was also invited to bring her choirs to the Oregon Bach Festival in Eugene, Oregon in 2015. This was an emotional experience for all involved, reminiscent of her experience in collaboration with the Minnesota Orchestra in Minneapolis in July of 2015. She described both with fondness and reinforced the connection between music communities in the United States and Cuba, regardless of the political climate at the time. Just as we came out, without even opening our mouths, people got up on their feet cheering for us. I said a few words. I remember I took the microphone, I had an interpreter, and I said, I bring a, mes a message of friendship from Cuba. Everyone fell silent. I couldn't go on because I was so full of emotions. Everyone was moved. Music unites the people. Government can mess things up, but not the people. We had a wonderful experience last year. We've been to 10 states with Entre Voces singing, and the reaction from the audience and the people has been wonderful. So much love and affection. For example, we had a moment in Minneapolis when we sang at the Symphony's concert hall. It's a huge venue and it was packed. When we came out to sing the first song, people yelled with excitement and waved Cuban flags. And I said to the choir, what is this? I don't know what to do, because I felt so full of love and affection. It was truly precious, beautiful indeed. We visited several states and it was like that every time. Digna was a talented child that grew up in poverty. She was given a piano scholarship after her father had her play for the director of a Cuban music archive in whose building he worked as a mason. She got her beloved piano after writing a letter to a television show to avoid being dismissed from piano lessons for having no instrument to practice on. The host of the show called on local artists who donated enough money to buy her a piano. Her family's apartment was one room where all five family members slept and a tiny kitchen in the corner. There was no additional room for a piano, so she slept in a small cot under the piano. She was 13 at the time of the Cuban Revolution, which resulted in a free system of music education she would not have had access to otherwise. Guerra said, I think this vocation to serve my country is important. Using my profession, because as a humble girl, my country gave me everything and gave me the chance to get an education. This is a topic that many people don't understand. I am thankful for the revolution because it gave me the means to develop the talent that I had. Because I once said this on an interview and someone on social media asked, but what about your talent? As if they don't know that the world is filled with talented people living in the streets without ever having an opportunity to develop or a school that can attend to develop the talents that nature has given them. And I was lucky to have the Cuban revolution on my side, which allowed me to do so. I was able to do this and even go to Germany on a scholarship. When would I have dreamt of studying in Germany? Never. I would have never been able to do this on my own means. Therefore, I am simply grateful and I will do everything I can do for my country. In addition to her musical and artistic administrative responsibilities, Guerra also served in the Cuban government as part of the National Assembly. Again and again, Digna described her nature as restless. As they say, everything is music and reason. Those are Jose Martí's words. Everything is music here. Wherever you look, it's music, music, music. But above all, my constant search for new things, things that pose new challenges, because I am restless. When it comes to music, I am always looking, 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 and looking for things that push me. That has made me develop all the time, and I will keep on doing this until the end. She is almost infamous for her high standards. I feel very accomplished because I have achieved things, and when there are things that don't work out, I am the first critic. I don't conform. I can easily say, this was trash, and you've made a mistake here, but when things go well, nobody can question me because I am the choir's first critic. I am not easily pleased. I am not the person who says, congratulations, it was great, if I know it was a load of garbage. I work like a meticulous little ant, and I don't stop until I get what I have in mind. Guerra's philosophy regarding community in the choral setting is that it determines the work that is done. Guerra uses the term communion as a descriptor of the bond fostered between singers. When you sit down to sing, there must be a communion, a connection in every sense, human, musical. Music doesn't flow when this person doesn't talk to that person. There isn't going to be any music there, forget it. There can't be music like that. 
Potential for relationship building is the first trait she looks for in potential singers. After that is determined, then the singing follows. Guerra is confident that she will teach singers good vocal technique, but one's personality and temperament is paramount to success in her choirs and much more difficult to adjust. Before musical talent, you have to be a human being, a good person. If not, I don't want them in the choir. And I have let people go you can't imagine. People that come here to harm, to talk about people behind their backs. I don't want any of that in my choir. Because then where does the music go? That's why you have to get along with whoever you have right here. If you are singing with a chip on your shoulder, there is never going to be music. Guerra exudes mutual respect for one another and for the communal work. One of her singers observed, the more you know her, the more you respect her and your commitment is increased. She will tell you, you have to demonstrate that your chair is worthy of your name. This is not an orchestra where you just play your instrument. We have voices. Voices communicate feelings. If you don't get along with your conductor, that is what the audience is going to receive. The same goes if I have a fight with the person standing next to me. That can't be. Because when you sing, even if you can't see it, it's like an invisible cloak that wraps us all together. Lady Sotomayor, conductor of De Profundis, the second chamber choir in the Coro Nacional, holds one of Digna Guerra's coveted few private conducting studio slots. At the time of the interview, she was among Cuba's younger conductors at 25 years old. She said, with 22 singers currently in De Profundis, there are 22 different personalities, 22 different music levels, 22 different educations, and the conductor has to have the magic to join all of these different characters and make it look seamless, to unify everyone's thoughts as much as possible. You'll never make it one, but at least they can respect each other's ideas. Respect that even if you don't agree, you do it like that for the choir. There is a phrase the maestra gave me and she doesn't like it, but for me it's the reality in every choir. A choir is a group of happy people conducted by an unhappy person. In a broader sense, this is not so accurate, but in some concerts, it's like this. Akai described Guerra's warmth with the choir born of their common daily struggles, hardships inherent in everyday Cuban life, several of which I witnessed in my travel to Havana, including unreliable or insufficient public and private transportation, infrastructure, electricity, food, and water. There is a lot of respect but there is a lot of caring because she will walk into a room and unless she is carrying many things or she is hosting a visitor, she will hug and kiss everybody. She doesn't hesitate. She just asks, what do you need? I think this is a human condition you are born with and that you develop. This is part of her personality. Otherwise, she wouldn't survive so much work, so much hardship. We face hardship because our country is beautiful on all of that, but there are many difficulties we have to overcome every day. Guerra's conducting philosophy requires the conductor to initiate the connection with the student. She lamented her observation of what is reminiscent of the common trope of university faculty in an ivory tower or a conductor literally on a pedestal, far removed from those they lead. Singer Yamila Monge said of Guerra, when someone doesn't understand, she finds the way. Guerra said, I have seen in my many travels that the teacher tends to be a stuck-up figure, isolated from the world, who feels he holds, like we say, Christ by the beard. And that's a mistake. You can know everything, but try to pass on your knowledge with humility, because you may not know everything. Or maybe you are, in fact, an expert. But if you don't know how to pass on this knowledge, your expertise is worthless. Music is a delicate field. It's emotions. You make music and the wind takes it away. It's an act that slips through your fingers. So you have to make people enjoy it. Make people go to heaven with you. And if you have to go to hell, take them with you. Do you understand? That's my goal. Try to have everyone here under my arm so we can go together wherever we have to go. But not from my position or because I am who I am. No, I am nothing. I am the musician who wants you to enjoy and feel and suffer with me through the music we are making. That is very important because you don't always have this dichotomy between student and teacher. 
I am the teacher and the student is right over there. No, no, no. It's not about distances or hierarchies, but about weaving yourself in the crowd so they can give themselves sincerely through music. What drives you? What is your true north? We think of the geographical north on a compass and we think symbolically of our own internal compass that always points north. This pandemic has changed us or revealed things in us all. I encourage you to watch the ACDA webinar featuring Bigna in May during the pandemic. She said, we have learned to be more human, to work with more solidarity. At 9 p.m. each night throughout the pandemic, as in the U.S., all would clap for healthcare workers, and Vigna would play the Cuban national anthem on her piano, which was broadcast throughout the island. She took that opportunity to also celebrate and thank healthcare workers in the United States. The first thing she plans to do once it is safe is to put on a concert for the healthcare workers. What is your true north? Perhaps it is a relentless centering of your students. Perhaps it is the dismantling of oppressive systems, a spiritual connection with God, one another, or the earth. It could be facilitating joy, which especially today is its own act of resistance. Perhaps it is the complexity of redefining or reclaiming patriotism. This is true for Cubans and the Cuban diaspora as well as here in the U.S. I leave you with two quotes from the theologian and civil rights leader, Howard Thurman, as you ponder your true north, your sense of purpose. There is something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. It is the only true guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Thank you for spending this webinar with me.